Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com um, and the associated website. So information, resources, activities for people who work in and around the global medical communications, medical education, medical publishing type businesses um, and the associated businesses. Uh, we also do a lot of work for people who want to come into medcoms, uh, maybe as a medical writer or as a, an account manager and so on. So uh, lots of information for you at First Medcoms Job. Um, it's worth having a look at Network Pharma TV where we have more than 500 videos now on all sorts of matters around medcoms so there's lots of resource to go and have a look at um, a lot of um, a lot of those videos in fact in network farm tv are generated from webinars like this and um, we're regularly having speakers and, and panelists from all over the world um, today i'm delighted we've got matt in from the states we're going to be talking about ai uh, which is why we've got a particularly large audience today from all over the world uh, matt i'm not going to steal your thunder um, we're just going to have a conversation here um, but let's just start with with you telling us about yourself, Matt, and um, just paint a little bit of the picture of Inizio, because not everyone will know much about Inizio. But importantly, from your point of view, um, tell us about your journey. Um, and my key question, I mean, how does a man in, in Medcoms end up with a job title that's Global Chief Artificial and Augmented Intelligence Officer? That's a grand sounding title. So please sure. just introduce yourself and talk a bit about, um, about what, how you got there. Sure. For first, uh, Peter, thank you so much for having me on on the the show. Um, I've been a you know a long time uh, you know watcher, listener, um, audience member, uh, all the rest, and it's really like a true pleasure and honor to to be here as a, a, a panelist. It's a, really like a dream come true. So thank you so much for for having me on on today. Um, I've been in life sciences my entire career, which is twenty five years. Um, most of that time in medical affairs. I started in medical about 23-ish years ago as a field medical science liaison. I've been in almost every role you can be in, in, in home office medical, from CME to investigator-initiated studies to, you know, opinion leaders, advisory boards, um, publications, grants, um, you know, it launched a number of, of molecules uh, still on the on the client side. I was at a company that became part of AbbVie, uh, worked at Berger Ingelheim for a number of years, um, both in, in the States as well as in, in Germany. Um, and uh, switched on to the kind of consulting agency side back in the late 2000s uh, or so, um, and had really a number of, kind of leadership roles, uh, both in, in product strategy as well as in client services, analytics, um, worked in, in medcoms directly, sitcoms uh, especially, um, over the last really 15 years uh, for um, really groups like Adelphi, both in the US and the UK, which some folks on the, on the phone I, I know are affiliated with, um, as well as uh, at Omnicom uh, in at ProEd. Uh, I ended up taking on the role of Executive Vice President Global Practice Lead for Apothecom, running Sitecom and Pubs back in 2015, and then started the analytics team here, uh, what became our data analytics uh, group back in 2016. And really, it started with a similar kind of question that led to what ultimately became our AI practice, which is what is really the effect of and how can we optimize or make better the communications work that we're doing across the, the full kind of book of business that we serve in order to really speed time to decision for clinicians, patients, and other stakeholders. And I think, you know, a lot of the groups we were working with really found value in the communications that we were supporting, but they, they couldn't kind of tell which areas were most impactful or that were of the things that they were supporting. They didn't know, you know, what say physicians or researchers or investigators or payers or other groups um, actually did with that content when they actually read it or they saw it in their environments and they came to us kind of curious to learn more and uh, we started our analytics practice just as a way of helping to answer some of those kind of burning questions in the minds of leadership in the biopharma and biotech and medical device and um, you know digital therapeutic space to try to see if we could give them some support for the value proposition questions of um, how that evidence was really translating into value. Go on, yes, go. Yeah, keep going. So, yeah, so <laughs> yeah, I mean, the journey, yeah. <laughs> it, it's the, the, the journey. So, I mean, I think, you know, it, it was the case like, you know, a number of years ago when we did this this work, seven, you know, eight years ago or so, that to answer that question, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, the way that many kind of research and analytics and, you know, data firms are. And I think, you know, I saw a number of folks as they were joining the, the call today, people that I've known for a while out, out in the world, that, you know, a, a lot of this work, you know, is, uh, it begins like with a mixed methods, you know, consideration of Paul Quant um, kind of approach. Um, in our world, it was quite similar. We had you know, a lot of that kind of baked into to the approach, but you know, we also leveraged early on some considerations 
solutions in the AI sleeve, things like natural language processing. And uh, we, we got involved quite early in things like machine learning and deep learning. And, you know, it was one of our one of our tools. And, you know, it was, wasn't the only thing we did, but, you know, we did a fair amount of, of artificial intelligence uh, work in, in, in part of the practice. And I think if, you know, we started in 2016 and maybe AI was, you know, maybe 10% of what we did in 2016, maybe a quarter in 2017, maybe a third in 2017, so on and so forth. By the time I, I left the practice early <clears throat> earlier this year, um, you know, probably at least 85, 90% of what we were doing was AI enabled or AI powered to some extent. And I think, you know, the world was very different five, six, seven years ago. You know, it, it was often the case that when we would wor work on a major project, um, regardless of kind of what the functional area was or what the you know brief looked like uh, you know on behalf of a of a client team it it often wasn't the case that a group would come to us and say you know what we really want is this you know ai thing or this ai deliverable no one really asked for that and it wasn't until honestly within the last maybe 6 months that we even saw a, a request where the word ai or the phrase ai right. was even explicitly mentioned but you know what what people did care about was that we were being efficient with resources that we were finding a, a way to extract value from the consideration and often it was a, an artificial intelligence mechanism to pull that through and we have an intact data science team that could help support that that request um, and you know in many cases the groups with whom we work didn't even I think sometimes know that what we were doing was AI, if you will. They just yeah. knew that what we were doing was valuable and it was able to then scale and kind of really be generalizable and considered you know, a, a part of the way we worked and the products and services that we were able to support. I think you know, with the end of that last year with ChatGPT emerging on the scene and people's kind of temperature and kind of tenor for AI increasing a bit. Now that those questions started to increase a, a bit where folks were saying, well, you know, we'd, we'd like, actually like you to do this, but we want you to do it using AI. And we're like, we're already doing that. You know, right. But, you know, it was just more of a kind of pulling back the curtain a little bit and saying, yeah, we're, we're already doing that. We've been doing it for seven plus years and we have hundreds of projects that are completed in that, in that realm, which is no one ever cared enough to ask us how it was being done. Um, so it was more of a kind of just kind of being transparent about how the how the work actually got completed. Um, and then, you know, it got to the point where, you know, it, starting really late last year, you know, November, December of last year, the beginning of this year, where our, our practice, which was a, a mix of some digital consulting, some software as a service, some events analytics, and kind of a, a discussion about what's possible with artificial intelligence, the amount of time that was being requested by executives out of the space and by professional societies and other third parties got to the point where I was literally spending probably 12, 13 hours a day deep in on the practice. And then probably another four or five hours a day, every day from, you know, late U.S. Thanksgiving till U.S. Valentine's Day, that three, four month period, working probably another five hours on top of the 12 hours every day, just to kind of keep up with what was evolving on in the AI space. And my boss, who's been on this show, came to to me and said, you know, this is untenable. You can't really work, you know, 12, 13 hours a day deep in on a, you know, digital consulting advanced analytics practice. And then also be, you know, kind of building this kind of artificial intelligence bolus kind of around it as well. You know, would it potentially make sense to divorce the two and have someone else come on and take on the advanced analytics role as, as president potentially. And then you focus just on artificial intelligence exclusively. And I'm like, hmm, I hadn't never really, really thought about that, but that sounds like a, a reasonable plan. And that's what we ended up doing. We hired someone to come on as president as the medical analytics innovation group. And as of April, I was promoted to chief AI officer, which has this long title. It wasn't a title that I <laughs> selected, but it, it's global chief artificial and augmented intelligence officer. And I just, when people ask me what it is, I just say, head of AI or chief AI officer, right, right. but it, it, I think it reflects the the kind of evolution of the space because some people still kind of gravitate towards artificial intelligence as like what they're interested in or what they're doing, but our, our disposition is more focused on augmented intelligence where it's the, the subject matter expert, the medical strategist, the, the person that's a professional enrolled partnering with AI to achieve this synergistic vision of the two working together better than either alone, that's the augmented component. So having both in, in my title gives a, you know, kind of a, a, a path of travel, if you will, for folks that yeah. are a little bit less kind of uh, clear on kind of where, where we are, what we believe in. So it's a, it is a bit of a mouthful, but uh, it, it does uh, hopefully give folks a little bit of a sense as to what we, what we stand for. 
Okay, but it also reflects, um, I guess, the sort of size and, and type of organisation you're a part of. Um, can just say a few words about Inizio, because, I mean, a lot of people will know Inizio, um, but equally, there'll be people watching this who aren't that familiar with the, the business, and they'll be more familiar with, frankly, smaller medcoms agencies. You know, what you're what you're representing it does fall out of the fact that Inizio is very large <laughs> you know it's on a different scale to most medcoms agencies so just say a few words about the evolution and, and, and the setup of the business yeah sure sure yeah so as, as i mentioned before so i've been here for almost eight years and when i when i joined i, I joined as head of the psychom and pub sleeve within apothecom so anisio has um been out to market for just about a year and a half or so um it, we we were formed by a private equity firm um that had acquired a number of the constituent parties uh, at an earlier point the groups that folks will be familiar with are probably at least within the medcom sleeve ashfield nucleus and metastrava slash apothecom yeah. and then across the the overall inizio the corporate inizio where we have really kind of four major groups which are marketing communications medical which i just referenced engage which is really a kind of experiences and, and kind of training organization and advisory and within advisory there are a number of other business units that people will have, probably have some familiarity with like stem and dynamic and putnam and smart analysts and other groups like that um, but across the, the overall organization probably around fifteen thousand or so people uh, and and just deep in on life sciences and health so is it, unlike a you know, Omnicom, where I used to work for eight years, or WPP, where I was for a bit, which have very extensive professional services organizations, but serve you know really all verticals, if you will. And we we only focus on life sciences and health. We don't have any customers outside of of healthcare and life sciences, and you know, really as a result, represent both the deepest and broadest bench within within that space. So to your point, I think having a kind of a dedicated role for artificial intelligence across the medical sleeve within the Nizio makes sense because of our, our size and scale. But you know, I, when I was first appointed to the role in, in the spring, I, there really weren't any other similar roles across industry or across the professional services space. But I, I have been seeing over the last couple of months, a number of similar appointments within, especially the holding company level. There's a similar person that has a role like mine at WPP. There, there's someone that just got announced similarly within Omnicom uh, at, at the bigger kind of company level. And I think it is an evolving trend that most of the major companies will have chief AI officers either with that title or something like you know head of AI or something similar. It just, it, 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 it's a both an inflection point for the space at large and also a, a little bit of a departure from the way of the way that business was done up until this point where you know ai as I, I was just mentioning like a lot of our teams did ai we have data science teams but the way that the business requested the work to be done or that our clients saw it kind of being carried out was perhaps a bit you know centralized a bit um, you kind of removed from the rest of of the work and now as ai is evolving to more of a an organizational consideration Having uh, that kind of expectation live sent, live you know, across the organization really does demand a kind of strategic role, uh, an executive consideration, and a, a, a really some contributions to help the organization at large consider how to upskill, consider you know what it means across the full portfolio of services and solutions, consider you know long term strategy and the rest. It's becoming less of a a tactic, I guess you could say, and and more of a, a kind of transformative catalyst. And I, I've really seen that over the last, definitely over the last year, but certainly over the last eight years, where like people, it used to be like a nice thing, like, you know, you know oh, we could, you know, throw a little AI at it, you know, six, seven years ago. Now it's really like a, an imperative. If you don't have a, an AI consideration within and across the business, especially in our space, it, it's, it's going to become a, a challenge moving forward. Okay. And um, we're probably going to have to be a little bit careful with this discussion, partly because we haven't got a lot of time. Um, the AI can cover all sorts of things um you know and lots of people are very confused about the terminology and what's ai or versus machine learning or whatever i mean a lot of the focus is on the sort of chat gpt type um type tools yeah um and you know we've already had questions coming in about how how can we use those sorts of tools um, and maybe we can get in over the course of the conversation we can have some specific examples of of how people can can start using those tools but i did want to effectively start by addressing the fact that you are um, I mean, you know, the, the AI environment has, has changed dramatically in the last six months. And, um, you know, one of the calls has been for professional organizations in our industry to be um, providing guidance. So 
I think an important part of today is for you, if you don't mind, just to talk through, as far as I know, there's three, you know, important initiatives that you're part of with um, Healthcare Communications Association, ISMAP and, and, and MAPS, the medical affairs professionals. Can you just give us some top line? I mean, all those organisations are trying to help their memberships um, um, work out how to use AI. And there's a strong element of how to use things like medical writing AI tools. Yeah. yeah. Um, in all three cases, there's, or let's say there's varying degrees of openness. Some of it is just they're, they're talking to their members only and some of them are a bit more open. But I think it's relevant to all of us to know sort of what directions they're going in, the sorts of um, issues and challenges and, and advice that's being being given. Can you just help us by by talking through what, what you're seeing they're doing? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, first, I, I, I'll you know just share that I think at some point, most of the major groups in our space and like the MedCom space, will either you know adopt their own stance on artificial intelligence or potentially pick up uh, you know a position paper or a, a similar kind of guidance that another organization has already put forth and most of that will happen within the next say six months uh, but just you know writ large uh, the the ones that I'm directly associated with you know, either as architect or author at, at this point are the ones you mentioned maps uh, the healthcare communications association here in the UK as well as um, the, the ISMAP organization. And they all those groups are, are in a position where their membership, and you know, when I say membership, I specifically mean, for the most part, the biotech, pharmaceutical, medical device, and also agency members um, are coming to them, and you know, patient engagement, you know, other stakeholders as well, are coming to them and to their executive leadership and saying, you know, we're, we're hearing a tremendous amount of concern and consideration out there in the environment around artificial intelligence. To your point, ChatGPT is out there in the world. People don't know what, if it is applicable in the consumer sense, if it has appropriateness in our environment, what it's going to do for medical writing, what it means for you know, our authors, what it means for experts. And you know, we can't stay silent. We need to say something. So what is our position as an organization, as a member organization, on these topics. So it, it's not like, you know, the societies were sitting around, you know, in the spring and like, hmm, you know, we should probably put something out. That's that's not really what happened. Every one of those bodies was hearing an outcry from their membership saying, you know, we, we need you to stand up and, and act and react to this kind of concern that's out there and state in an unequivocal way what kind of good looks like for the membership and provide support and resources in an equivocal fashion so that groups can kind of figure out kind of what good looks like and then where to where to follow. So a lot of these considerations are responses, if you will, to the membership uh, kind of outcry that that emerged in, in different respects. The HCA one, uh, is, it was uh, something that probably was initiated first. Mike Dixon, the CEO, came to our foresight committee that I'm part of and uh, was indicating that the, the membership across the UK was uh, really asking for a disposition uh, as to kind of whether the AI kind of the discourse was, um, you know, really somewhat kind of topical or or whether, you know, it was transformative. And, you know, the roadmap that HCA put out uh, uh, probably about three weeks ago or so, which I, I hope folks have had a chance to read, it's, it's out there, you know, published both in the CMRO journal, which is part of Taylor and Francis. It's also published on the HCA website. Um, it, it does state that, you uh, AI really is a, a kind of transformative consideration for healthcare communications broadly, whether that's you know public relations or disease state education or medcoms or you know the broader part of the, the space. And that if groups don't currently have a policy, they don't have a, a statement or a protocol around AI, they should look to adopt one in the near term. That you know, just working in an environment where you know, there is no kind of stated expectation around AI is probably not the most helpful thing in the world. And there are some suggestions about what that policy should include, what those variables are, and kind of what good looks like from here to, to follow, if you will. And Liz Mercer at Langland and myself co-authored that document, and we did a little webinar to follow, kind of talking through some of the considerations for people to, to think about as they stand that up. But it really is kind of like a, a catalyst or like a... Um, Thanks, Peter, for posting that in the in the chat. Um, a, a catalyst to think about: Hey, like if I'm working in the area and I'm at you know an agency, I'm at a consultancy, I'm at a biotech, I'm at a pharma, I'm at a patient advocacy group, and I don't yet have an AI policy. Now's probably the time to put one in place, and you know to think about progressively what that means for me and my staff, and reach out for the right resources as things progress, because this isn't going away. 
it's not going to, the horse is not going to go back in the barn, so to speak. And if we don't support our teams, it's, it's only going to lead to challenges within our organization and for the people we serve. And I think that it was really kind of a, a kind of trial balloon to kind of float that up and say this, this matters and it matters now. The, the ISMAP organization is a little bit kind of broader in scope. The, the, the things that were tasked to us as the task force for ISMAP, so the, the task force that supports the artificial intelligence work is um, it, it's a, a little bit more multifunctional, if you will. There are folks on the task force that represent biopharma. There's some folks from Pfizer, from Amgen, some other teams. Um, there's agency side folks. Um, I lead the agency side part as co-chair of the task force. The other co-chair is Keith Goldman from AbbVie. Um, and then there's some technology folks as well as so on, on the AI side and some folks that represent publishers also. And there are about 10 people on the AI task force. The AI task force for ISMAP has kind of four work streams. The first is around a position statement and roadmap, which is a bit deeper and broader than the HCA statement. Uh, it is final. It has been submitted to a journal and it will be published within a little over a fortnight. I can't state the exact date, but it's coming pretty soon. And in addition to the declarative uh, kind of topical areas that HCA mentioned, it also goes really deep in on the type of artificial intelligence that um, is recommended for teams within SciComs, publications, MedComs, scientific platforms, and all the rest to adopt the fact that it needs to be responsible AI, and that there's an expectation, a longitudinal expectation for professional development for everyone in the space moving forward, that it's not a kind of episodic thing, like you go to a you know, ISMAP EU meeting in London and kind of check that box and like, oh, I'm done, that's it. No, it's, it's a lifelong expectation from this point forward that in order to remain current and effective in role, there is an AI expectation that exists moving forward from this point forward. And, and as ISMAP, we'll continue to provide resources to support that, that, that expectation, but it is an expectation to, to as part of the role moving forward. The, the second work stream as part of the task force is to actually stand up those resources. So we're working on a major tech partnership to kind of provide that content out to the teams and That'll be announced hopefully in London at the at the meeting on January twenty third and twenty fourth in, in London. Right. Uh, we have a we're setting up a new website for uh, competencies like the CMPP exam and, and all the rest that follow. And uh, I saw in the chat some people asked about applications beyond ChatGPT that are relevant to MedComs and SciComs and publications. There are more applications in generative that exist than can be named. There are literally probably thirty to fifty that come out every day, every single day. Every of day. There, there are probably about a thousand literally that exist in generative just in 2023. Um, the ISMAP team, the task force, we are standing up a, a kind of AI journey, if you will, that will show stakeholders how they get from kind of zero to a hundred, what they need to do to stand up an AI capability within their organizations. The first step of which is a policy or protocol. The second, which is training and development. The third of which is thinking about, do they build a model internally within their organizations, which many companies are doing. We're doing a lot of the large pharmaceutical companies are doing, et cetera, et cetera, but not everyone will do. Um, and then from there, what apps or other platforms they need to consider. And we need to kind of think through that journey in order to think about what maturity levels people can actually handle and, and then also what they can what they can parse. So that those are the major things that ISMAP is doing. It's a longitudinal consideration. The task force will you know, live in perpetuity. It's a lot of work, I will say. Um, and I think, you know, for those involved, you know, it, it's it's an ongoing commitment, but it's it's an important one because the space will be transformed by AI. It's not like this, you know, like a one-time one thing, like, you know, infographics that are important for people to they can figure out. And then once they get, get you know, in, into the world, it's you know, move to the next thing. The AI topic will literally reimagine and transform everything we do. And there's a lot that's kind of considered. To that end, the, the MAPS work that we've done is also somewhat transformative. It's across everything medical affairs. So it's even bigger than the ISMAP kind of consideration. Um, and MAPS wanted to, to kind of help the medical affairs audience recognize that there actually has been a lot of um, artificial intelligence work already and a lot of generative work already that's been delivered across the universe that people may not be cognizant of. So what we did first was we went out to the members of MAPS, all the industry stakeholders, the, the partner solution companies like Benizio and consultancies and vendors and tech companies and the rest. And we asked them for case studies of where AI has actually been effective and successful. And we pulled this white paper together that I think was published on the 28th. I, I, I think uh, Peter just posted it in the chat. Um, 
that is really like a compendium of all the successes in AI that exist at present. So when people say, oh, well, you know, this AI thing sounds great, but like, you know, how does it actually work in reality? The, the, the MAPS paper showcases what is possible today and what actually works in reality today. And to Peter's point, like the space is changing so fast that yes, these things have been implemented successfully in multiple cases already. But if they were, the paper was published in September, it meant that those things had to have been done at least as late as June. So it's already October. So the you know we're we're already so much more capable in October than we were in June because the tech is evolving so quickly. So if if those things were possible in late summer, by the time you know Christmas hits, we're almost an order of magnitude stronger in terms of capability than we were in you know two quarters ago. So you know I, I already noted um, you know, that that a, a previous colleague of mine is now chairing a similar initiative at EMWA on the. Um, Medical Writers Association uh, side to look at the AI disposition across uh, medical writers. There are a couple other similar initiatives we're seeing on the editorial side of things. Uh, as I said, there will likely be a similar disposition across the entire stack, um, across all of MedComs to adopt a disposition and a stance that suggests that AI is transformative, that folks need to adopt a policy and a position to take on education and training, and then to really start transforming the way they work uh, you know, as things progress forward, and I think you know, we're happy to kind of continue to be part of that of that work, um, and and you know, to help you know provide counsel and uh, consideration to those that are are working on their own initiatives as well. And um, that's great. And um, I was just going to stick that in as well to the chat. Sorry. Um, the um, there's lots of. I mean, it's interesting that you know in in the spring there was lots of excitable people talking about this stuff. Um, basically driven by chat GPT, let's, you know, it was very specific. Um, th then it all went a bit quiet as far as I could see and people were starting to sort of like close the doors and say, well, we need to work this out in-house. Um, and then, you know, September, well, we're October, aren't we? October 2023, let's make that point um, that that's the date that we're talking because it'll be out of date tomorrow sort of thing. Um, we're seeing the this proliferation of professional organisations and, and so on providing guidance. Um, I just stuck um, a quick link in the chat for the ICMGAE. Um, it's worth just acknowledging that bodies like that are, are, are sort of incorporating AI type guidance into what they're doing for publications and so on. Um, so I, I think that's really useful because um, I hope a lot of people have gone, oh, that's interesting. You know, these professional organisations doing it and there's some there's some signposts to where you can get more information and hopefully if you're members of those organizations you can get quite involved in those initiatives let's just draw back from that um and can we take some specific examples we've had a number of questions coming in you know just you know how does i think jane asked a question quite quickly you know take a, something like a symposium how can you how can you apply ai to a symposium what do people mean when they're talking about that can you talk around that you know, what are the sort of specific sort of things in which you might might do? Yeah, I mean, there's there are so many possible examples. It's it's hard to to kind of pinpoint one. Um, but I mean, they're depending upon you know kind of what your role is and you know kind of what you're being asked to to kind of support. Um, you know, there are things that can be considered with regards to the content. Uh, there are things that can be considered with regards to audience generation. Uh, there are things that can be considered with regards to faculty preparation and delivery. Uh, there are things that can be considered in terms of learning transfer. You know, say someone delivers a symposium in Copenhagen or in Rome or in Bristol or somewhere else and actually have a, a role to play, right? Maybe they're an investigator or they're a clinician. They actually see patients at some point. The intention I would imagine is that they go back and you know to their job to their you know, practice and they apply that learning in, in, into the place of care and they and they improve someone's health. Um, you know the the learning transfer from symposia back to practice is a bit weak at present. You know there there are a number of considerations from a, a generative perspective that can help uh, with that kind of far transfer from symposia to to place of care. Um, a lot of the it pretty much the, the the dialing back a bit the the way that that we think about generative and the way that I think most people are thinking about it is it's it's probably better to, to start thinking about the places within our work and or you know you can think about the places within your your own personal world like not even so much within medcoms but just like what you do as a person where either you find a lot of friction uh, you know where things just you know don't go as easily as they should uh, or where it's like a little bit difficult to come up with ideas for things that are requested either by the team, by client, by others. 
Um, and, you know, that the team struggled to, to kind of come up with meaningful value in those regards, like say for symposia, like one of the things that you hear a fair amount with symposia, I used to do symposia all the time in a previous life, um, is that, you know, if you go to any symposia, any given therapeutic area, like, you know, ESMO is live and right now ish, if you will, Madrid, you know, most of the symposia say in oncology and the titles for symposia end up sounding almost like cookie cutter images of each other all the time. Like, it doesn't matter how, what people kind of try to do, but they sound pretty similar to each other after a, a time or two. So, you know, naming titles of symposia so that they sound distinct from each other so that they don't kind of accidentally plagiarize a previous title and that they actually indicate what's being discussed so that the attendees know what is indicated and they actually show up is, is actually a little bit more of an art than it is a science. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of teams struggle with this. Like they, they struggle with trying to figure out like the right way to name a symposia. Generative is actually quite good at this. Um, and, and it's, it's, it is something that that requires a little bit of finesse, a little bit of prompt engineering, so to speak, if you will. You can't just go into ChatGPT or any generative tool and say, like, give me the symposia title for my ESMO symposium in Madrid. Like, first of all, it, the, the platform doesn't know who you are, what your brief is, what molecule you're supporting, what the learning objectives are, what the strategic or scientific platform is you're looking to communicate it, it it's, it's not a magic wand it doesn't like read your mind yet you know we just give it five to eight years but that's a little joke but um it it, it doesn't uh, it, it doesn't anticipate that so you you have to develop a rapport and a relationship with the platform to help it understand what your context and content is but after some time it can definitely put forward multiple suggestions that far extend the aperture if you will the remit far beyond what the team's able to come up with on their own, which may not be the things you actually use, you know, externally, but they could be things that are like a starter for 10. Like they help, like help you think about what's possible. And generative is really great at, uh, at providing like a complementary or alternative perspective. It may not be like having like another, like Robert or Jane on your team, like another person, another human on the team, but having this, AI perspective, this augmented perspective that's so far off the course than what you ever would have thought about that it, it makes you kind of like think about like, oh, I never even would have thought about, you know, suggesting a zebra as like the way of identifying a rare disorder. But now right. thinking that way, it makes me think of five other things that I wouldn't have thought about. And now I'm going to pick one of those. And that that might be a horrible example because people do actually think about zebras all the time for rare disorders, but <laughs> you get my point. And like it, it really helps you think tremendously for ways that uh, people talk about like overcoming writer's block or uh, really thinking out of the box and like really kind of forcing people to kind of go down lines of inquiry that otherwise may not be explored. And those types of things are relatively cheap, both with time and, and expense. And, and do create value quickly. On the on the speaker efficacy side, there are ways of using generative to help the, the users, like yourself, the team, the, the client, the speaker, prepare for delivering content so that when they actually share education with an audience, that what they share in the room is significantly more effective and engaging than what they would have shared just kind of getting a set of slides and kind of walking to the room and delivering them. And almost using the platform as a, a simulation or like a, a a way of kind of improving self-efficacy. Um, again, it requires some engagement to get to that point, but you know the the utility is far beyond what kind of the default proposition is. So there, the, we can have a, a four-hour conversation about all the things you could use generative for in a symposium. The problem is not finding use cases; it's prioritizing the use cases to the ones that are of most import for you and the team. And then helping the subject matter experts on your team develop the kind of AI skill set, the prompt engineering skill set to pull those out alongside the things that are of import. So they create value for you and your client. Or I think that's really important. Sorry, I think that's really interesting. And you've covered an awful lot of ground in there, I think, very quickly. And I think probably given some people some food for thought, there's quite a lot of chat going on in the chat now and people talking to each other, uh, which I think is quite interesting. But one of the th one of the frustrations I have when I'm talking to people um, is that, you know, in our business, they, we tend to, people tend to jump to, is AI going to take my job as a medical writer? Is it going to write this thing for me? Therefore, I'm no longer required. And I mean, and I've had, I've been I've seen some very fiery conversations around this sort of thing, but I think it sort of misses the point a little bit. And 
having said that, I'm not entirely sure it couldn't do some of the work for us, but you know, um, it's a, it's about this tool and ideation and so on and so forth. But one of the things that really gets me is how many people get excited about this topic, but haven't actually tried and played yeah. and done something. And I just wonder what your observations on that are. And as a, as a comment from where you sit, I mean, I haven't heard it very recently, but not so long ago, I was hearing a, um, about organisations that simply went, "Ye cannot touch Chat GPT." because yeah. of sensitivity and so on. And I, 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 my, my message to people is play with the damn thing, even if it's just on your own at home personally or something. If you don't play with it, you don't even start to understand what's possible with these sorts of generative models. So just from your perspective, what happens within the NIDEO, what happens as you see it across the landscape in terms of people either playing or not? And specifically, because that leads into the questions that are coming up about confidentiality and sensitivity and so on. So maybe just a couple of minutes on that. Yeah, I mean, first of all, like every the, the first consideration for, for everything is definitely, you know, confidentiality and, you know, private data, patient data. And those rules are different in every jurisdiction. So, you know, what what is permissible in the UK is different from what it might be in France, different in the US, different in Singapore, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, those things definitely take precedence. But that being said, there will come a time in the not too distant future when every major organization has an AI platform that they're leveraging. And when that time comes, to, to not put information into artificial intelligence when there are considerations to speed time to decision to improve efficiency and effectiveness when the alternative exists will be a disservice to, to humankind. Um, but you know, to Peter's point, like the you, you can't really make an opinion about something, anything, whether it's ChatGPT or you know a, 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 an air fryer, uh, unless you use it. Like it just it doesn't it doesn't matter what it is. And, you know, it, it's in this space, you, you can really tell who's used something by their opinions about it and how often they've used it. I, I said early, and you, you can see podcasts and interviews I did back in February and March on this topic, that you, you won't really develop an experience or an opinion about generative if you haven't gotten really frustrated with it, like almost yelling at it, if you will. Um, and also, if you haven't like almost stood up and said, "I this is unbelievable and amazing. I can't believe this is even possible." If you haven't gone to like both of those ends of the spectrum, where you're like so really almost angry at at a platform, and also so amazed that this is this is even possible. If you don't have that range of emotion, then you haven't used it enough. Uh, I we we do uh, within Anisio. So my role is kind of like split in three uh, across the organization. About a third of it is the type of stuff Peter's asking about, which I call kind of like innovation catalyst work, where we're helping uh, groups recognize what's possible and speeding them on the AI journey, if you will. The the middle part of my work is focused on doing experiments across Anisio Medical, where we support uh, AI. Uh, experimentation across the organization. We have probably over 250 experiments that we're doing right now just across our division where teams are using generative in lots of different ways. We have a partnership with OpenAI. We have internal partnerships that we've done with other teams. We have external partnerships with different platforms and people are testing every possible thing under the sun in MedComs you can imagine. And one of the teams I was with uh, earlier this week and she said something to me, she's like, you know, I, before I came into this pilot, I, I was, and she's in, in the UK, she said, you know, like I, she's like, I was really worried that, you know, ChatGPT was going to take my job. I don't have that fear at all anymore. Like I, like now I'm, I'm really just focused on how I can use and kind of understand and appreciate the way that generative thinks so that it can be like a, a colleague, almost like a junior colleague on the team. And like, that actually is like a huge win for us because to, when people think, you know, without experience that it's a threat, it, it's a, a huge blocker and a problem because it's, it's yeah. first of all, it's completely unfounded and not true at all. And just, it's like almost silly because when you use it for any length of time, you realize it's not a threat. And then when you get past that and realize that it actually can be quite helpful and, and a real compliment that, and the real focus is on training and on development and, and thinking about enablement and how our work processes change as a result, then that's where the real value is. And I, to Peter's point, when the only way to get there, the only way is not by listening to this, chat the only way is by dipping in deep on the actual platforms either if your company allows it within your environment or you find the things that you're really passionate about personally and, and it, those things could be like for me it's music but it could be sports it could be cooking it could be travel whatever you do personally that you really love there are generative applications in that environment that you will find value in 
And when you find them personally, the same type of considerations apply to work. It, 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 this isn't like in 2014 or 2009 when you could do a little bit of AI, you know, on the in the biopharma world and it just lived there. Now, everything that is generative is a societal issue. It's not just a life sciences issue <laughs> that we, we, you know, we kind of take our work home with us. If you see that, you know, you can find recipes or make new recipes at home for you and your family that you couldn't have done before, that's an example of innovation and efficiency. That same example applies to coming up with new content for a publication or coming up with content for a slide deck that it's a little, a little tiny bit removed, like, a, you know, with the hard hard right, if you will, um, but it's not so far removed that it's impossible. It's just a, a slight way of changing the way we think. The risk of asking a stupid question, in the um, in a company like Inizio, is prompt engineering now a thing? Do you have prompt engineers or do you teach people prompt engineering? Do they see it as a as a skill? Is it is it a word? Is it a phrase that's used? Is it a thing? It, it is a thing. We do have prompt engineers. We've had them for a long time. We don't have nearly enough. Um, you know, I, I I wish we had 10x more than we do have. I've, I've wished it for over a year. And um, we, we've added many, many, many more than we had, you know, a year ago. We can't get, you know, the, that role fast enough. I, I don't think any, any company on planet Earth can get them fast enough. Honestly, it's the, probably the most coveted position on planet Earth. And I, I have this kind of secret hope that the role shouldn't exist and that and that the role will go away and that they'll find a way to bake the skill set into the platform and that it won't actually be directly desired. But the longer that this goes on, I think the the the, the more likely it is that, that that hope of mine won't be seen through and they actually will need to have that as a skill set. Um, I think you know there, there, there are two different like types of, of prompt engineering flavors, if you will. And they're 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 not the same. Like there is a there's a type that helps modify the underlying models that come from the big tech companies. And in, in those cases, you really need like deep in data science, people that are trained in machine learning and prompt engineering, data engineering and the rest to help kind of refine a model for implementation across a specific use case. Like, you know, think for example, like, um, you know, trying to identify uh, and, and really suggest like a publication plan uh, in a therapeutic area that hasn't had really much uh, in it for 20 years. Like that's a very bespoke use case and building a model for that requires a lot of heavy data science. Uh, that's a very specialized skill set versus like someone that's parsing an existing model, like say ChatGPT or, you know, Bard or Anthropic or AskPy or one of the other models to come up with a couple of symposium titles for ESMO. That does require some skill but the skill to get to the ladder is like maybe two to five hours of prompt engineering training versus the, the former, which is hundreds of hours of training, maybe you know, master's or doctoral level education. So it's a very different consideration. Both are in high demand across the industry right now, and not just our industry, every, every vertical across every company on the planet. Um, <laughs> I've got one eye on the comments and questions that are flying around. There's some very specific ones flying around. So we're not going to cover all this off and I, 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 we're never going to. So I hope everybody's appreciating and thinking about what we're talking about. And and I know I can talk for you and people can reach out to you. LinkedIn is an easy way and so on. Um, there's just got to be more discussion about this, more yeah. playing with it, more experimentation and so on. Um, let's just throw one question at you um, uh, from where you sit. Um, there's concern over, and let's stick with the chat GPT type of environment. There's concern over plagiarism and and and, and so on. You know, just, you know, can you just talk a little bit to that? We've got a couple of questions that have come in, you know, um, is it plagiarizing? How do you, and, and importantly, I've seen examples or discussions on LinkedIn and elsewhere where people have talked about, well, specific, let's take a specific example. Pharma company has taken my manuscript, put it through a play, um, an AI detector, come back to me and said, 80% of this is generated by AI. Therefore, you have not done your job. There's quite a bit in there, but can you just talk, talk to that sort of an issue? Which, and again, it scares people a little bit, I think. Um, but, you know, can can you detect AI? In the, I mean, I'm not, I don't mean yeah. words in your mouth, but I mean it's posh, isn't it? Yeah, I mean th these these this is a really you know difficult topic because there there are so many like nuances and and specific areas within the topic that it's it's challenging to answer quickly. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll try first. Uh, you know the the plagiarism topic is um, more 
a parent for our children in schools than it is for us in medcoms. Um, because the you really shouldn't be using ChatGPT directly in medcoms hard stop. You shouldn't be using it, period, in medcoms hard stop. One, because it isn't built for a medical audience and the output is not written for a technical or patient audience. It's like the example I use, and if you've ever heard me speak, I say this all the time. It's like using your automobile to cook an omelet. Like you could open up the boot and like, if that's the right word, and I was using the wrong UK expressions, but like the, you could open up the, the hood of the car and like try to heat the car up and cook an egg on the, on the engine. And eventually you'll make an omelet, but that's not the intended purpose. ChatGPT is a consumer app with consumer language and it is not trained specifically for that purpose. So if you accidentally create something that's readable, that's not what it's for. And it's not meant for that intention. So it, it, that is not the right use at all. And no one should be doing it for that purpose at all. There are a number of purpose-built apps for scientific, okay. technical, medical, medcoms, medical affairs, but ChatGPT is not one of them. There are a number okay. of our, a number of the biopharma companies out there now have purpose-built generative models that use the, the model that underpins ChatGPT that have been fine-tuned and prompt-tuned that is engineered specifically for medcoms that it, it's not ChatGPT, but it's built from what underpins ChatGPT. Those things are purpose-built for medcoms. So for example, AbbVie has one of these, Johnson & Johnson has one of these, Pfizer is building one, Merck has one of them, Merck in the US, yeah. not Serono. There are a number of companies that have these purpose-built medcoms models. If they submitted your paper through, for example, in those cases, yes, they can align almost like as a, a comparison. If they see what comes through their model and what you come through to see like what portion of the text is in their model versus what's in your model, but it's not detecting how much is AI written versus how much is human written. Those types of detection models are notoriously weak and invalid, and every major AI body renders them useless. They, they are not helpful. They're, they only are used by like professional societies and other organizations to try to squeeze out AI writing. They, they have no validity, and they're not accepted by any organization. You know, it, it, it's it, it's the 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 way that the field is moving for AI. What's called provenance is to to raise up and make explicit the components of the final work that are contributed by AI that's called provenance so that when you as the viewer, and this could be in medcoms, it could be when you're watching the BBC, when you're watching you know, TV, when you're looking at social media, it'll be really clear to you in the final deliverable, what components were contributed by AI versus what were contributed by a human. And you'll be able to see either through a watermark or through what they're calling like a metadata raise like a little like tag on the top right part of the, of the corner of the, of the image how much came from ai how much came from human and that's going to be universal across everything you see from 2024 on whether it's watching the news looking at something on instagram or a paper because people are going to want to say how much of this is human created how much is ai created and the rest but that's intentional like what goes into the thing it's not what comes out it's only what goes in and that 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 governance that provenance is going to become a universal expectation. Okay, okay, that is that is opening up a bit of a Pandora's box of issues, isn't it? Um, let, we, 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 I, I knew we were going to run out of time. I wanted to just in the last minute or two. This is a big, a big ask as well. But Matt, I know that you talk about. Is this a fair thing to end on? You talk about reimagining medcoms, um, and I just wondered whether you could just say for the last minute or two what you mean when you're talking about reimagining medcoms yeah i mean it's just again this is not my uh kind of a creation if you will uh you know if you go and, and sit around a generative ai table often enough like i do you'll hear other leaders within the, their businesses whether it's in retail or finance or defense or telecoms or um, the government uh i was with someone from nasa in the u.s recently at a, at a conference and you know, they say when you start thinking about what's possible with generative, you start thinking about things like content or um, simulation or efficiency or effectiveness. 
and you think about what you can do with generative in those cases and actually make those changes to someone's role, you change, you know, 10% on efficiency, 10% on effectiveness, 10% on self-efficacy or training. Soon, if you've changed 30% of someone's job, is that really still their job? After 30, a third of your job has changed, is that really still the same job? Most people would probably say, no, that's like the next job I'm going to do. It's like my promotion job. So, and a, a lot of the things we're doing with these experiments internally are looking to like remedy or uh, really renovate at least a quarter to half of someone's role. So when, you, when you're doing that, when you're kind of really juxtaposing this like innovation regime on top of someone's work, it's really thinking about like, what will the work look like in 18 months, in three years, in five years? And if it changes by a half, that's not the same job. It's a, a, a transformed or reimagined work. And it's, it's nothing more, you know, kind of momentous than that. It's just, you know, if the work today is really great and important, MedComs is the thing that allows for novel science to reach clinicians and, and investigators so patients can derive value. If we can do that more efficiently and effectively in a way that people enjoy greater, let's do it. That's really important. Yeah. That's like God's work. We should do it. But in doing it, it's going to change how we work. It's going to change the way we work. And the way we work is going to become what we call smarter. Because if we can do it more efficiently and people enjoy it more and it's effective more, then it's going to be reimagined. That's that's pretty much the whole thing. Okay. And I think that and it does come back down to a point we've made in different ways during that conversation. People need to go out and embrace this to then allow that to be realized. Yeah. Yeah, um, I saw I saw a it's, comment it's, in the, it's exciting times. Yeah, I mean it, it it is I saw a comment in the in the chat. Someone said like, you know, institutions need to support education. They totally do. But I and I and we do, everyone does. But you know, there is a personal responsibility here as well. It's it's not an either or thing. It's a both end thing. You know, the institutions definitely need to provide education 100 percent but people do also need to take some personal responsibility. I'm not saying like, you know, in the course of a weekend, like that, you know, every waking hour, people need to be you know, scurrying up education and AI, but it would be worthwhile for people to start thinking, you know, download an app here or there, like try to think about, you know, if they're watching golf or they're watching, you know, football in the UK, like, you know, if, they're, if the narration is from generative, they understand a little bit more about where that comes from or what's coming out of it. So they're educated as a consumer, those things will help in the workplace because the whole world is being transformed. It's not just medcoms. Right. Okay. Right. Look, we're way over time. We'll start losing people. We should, we should draw a line there. I find it all fascinating. I'm not quite sure where we're going to end up, but I'm really, really delighted that you've been able to join us and, um, and talk because it's just fascinating listening to you. Um, I think it's also just valuable that we've been able to put out there where we're at with some of the professional organizations and the sorts of um, uh, guidance that's coming through. Um, there's a ton of stuff in the comments and, 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 and questions which we can look at later. Um, I'll say to anyone um, online today but or, or watching this later on, please do make contact. Um, Matt, I know you're very happy for people to talk to you. LinkedIn is an easy way to do so. Everybody play, engage, you know, within your organisations, within the professional organisations and so on. Um, and let's have more open discussion about these sorts of, these all this amazing array of options to use these amazing tools um, but for now i'm going to say a huge thank you um, so a quick wave uh matt and we'll say goodbye to everybody take care bye